Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 6th of February, 2024. It's Martin North here from Digital Finance Analytics. Great to have you on this evening. And uh, it's our monthly exploration of the markets and everything like that with uh, Damien, who's teed up and ready to come in just a second. Lots to talk about, of course. The RBA today um, held rates as expected. They ran their first press conference. We'll explore that briefly. We'll talk a little bit about the Magnificent Seven, or is it Magnificent Six? We might touch on China as well and what's going on there and what the implications might be for the Australian economy. And, of course, the broader question, what does all this mean in terms of um, investing, you know? The uh, forward expectations of earnings look to me to be weakening in some areas and quite strong elsewhere. So what does that all mean? So hopefully we'll be able to explore some of that today. Before I bring Damien in, let me just remind you, as I always do, that we're not providing specific finance or legal advice. General conversation only. Do please play nice in the chat room, but feel free to throw questions, comments in the chat, throw them in there. And, uh, you know, I don't necessarily look at everything that's going on in the chat, so uh, feel free to have other side conversations. But if you want to get your question uh, through to us, then use that Walk the World. That'll get my attention and get it in the queue. I've also enabled Super Chat, which means you can get your question to the top of the list or indeed make a contribution to what we do around here. Really appreciate all those who make contributions. It helps to cover some of the costs. We don't do this for profit. We do this because we think there's a really important conversation to have about what's going on. And uh, frankly, some of the mainstream media, to my mind, don't necessarily cover things that well. So we try and give a more hopefully balanced and uh, objective view of what's going on. Anyway, with that out of the way, let me bring Damien in. And uh, Damien, how are you going? Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you, Martin. Good to see you. I don't know about you, but it doesn't feel like a month. It feels more like a week or so since we had oh, the conversation. No. But there's All so this much. stuff I'd planned to do <laughs> and then it never got done. Yes, I know, but there's so much going on. Um, let's just briefly talk about the RBA. Of course, the RBA um, held their first press conference today and uh, there were a few, um, well, Mickey Mouse questions from the press. I have to say I wasn't particularly impressed by the uh, quality and preciseness of the questions, nor indeed of the mm. answers. But, uh, you know, the, the, to the top line, is, of course, that um, they're going to be data dependent. They don't see inflation coming into band until, uh, you know, 2026, middle of band. That's the latest uh, from the monetary policy statement. Uh, but, you know, then they said, well, you know, it might go up, might go down, might go sideways. So they're really playing the same uh, waiting game as other, as other central banks. And, uh, mm. you know, again, I think the markets were probably expecting more cuts more quickly. Um, and she's always said, well, you know, we're not forecasting. We're just giving you our modelling. Um, any takeouts from you? I mean, there wasn't a huge amount yeah. of surprise for me. No, there wasn't There wasn't heaps in it. I guess there's a couple of different, a couple of things I'd, I, I'd like to note with it. So one is uh, they did downgrade their forecasts for some of the uh, light, later inflation. So so they are obviously, you know, the, the numbers they're seeing are similar to the numbers we're seeing, that the inflation is coming off pretty quickly. Um uh, they didn't note, I guess, though, a whole a sort of, you call it more of a hawkish hold. I'm mean, talking more about, you know, um, that they might ra raise again, which I don't think they will, but, you know, I guess that was sort of, they're keeping that, I guess, at least the rhetoric up in terms of that. Um, and then and then the final one is that, yeah, as, as a new person in the seat, um, I think uh, her... Uh, the risks for her in terms of making a decision are higher than the risks of not doing anything. Yep. So, you know, if she puts rates up and uh, and inflation crashes faster or you get higher unemployment or whatever it is, then she'll be held to account for that. If she puts rates down and inflation comes back, you know, she'll be held to account for that. But if she doesn't do anything for a little while, then that's sort of that, well, that was what the last guy was doing anyway. And so, you know, it's sort of, um, yeah. So so I think there's a there's probably a... Uh, a tendency to to uh, there usually is a tendency to to do nothing, um, but uh, but I think there's probably more of a tendency now than what there usually is. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And um, you know, she did she was asked whether the November rate hike was appropriate, and she said absolutely it was based on what was going on then. Um, to mm. my mind, actually, the, you know, the the AUD is an interesting thing to look at because um, you know if you look at some of the um, the things that are going on there. Um, you'd have to say that uh, you know the, the it, it, it's sort of wandering down, and of course, 
a weak Aussie dollar does have consequences. Um, so what is the relative strength of uh, Australia vis-a-vis -vis some of the other um, uh, other currencies around the place? Obviously, a strong um, US dollar at the moment. Um, mm. But that's got to be part of the thinking, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I think... Um... Uh, I mean, certainly from, uh, you know, internally in our strategy, uh, you know, uh, David, who you've had on this, David Llewellyn Smith, who you've had on this program mm. a few times, I think, yep. um, does a lot of the currency. And and so he was, for, for a while there, he was uh, talking about saying, you know, look, it's, you know, it's headed towards 70 cents. It probably wants to, um, probably wants to touch off 70 before heading lower. And, and he's changed his mind and gone, no, look, um, yeah, a, a week or two ago, changed his mind and basically said, yeah, no, it's, it's um yeah, it's had its top. It's, it's now, uh, it actually looks... Uh, yeah, we we just did a podcast last week on it. Um, yeah, it looks to us as if the uh, Australian economy, which was behind most of the other economies coming out of COVID, so because we had longer lockdowns and um, uh, we were sort of like you know, you know our growth rate didn't kick off until afters, our, our inflation was behind everyone else's. But given uh, the way the interest works work, work in Australia, uh, in the they they flow much much more quickly through to the Australian economy. And um, and effects over China. We're actually um, and the effects of all the people that are coming in. Uh, yeah, our our contention now is it actually looks like we're catching up and, and quite possibly going to pass some of these economies, and, and we might coming be coming down the other side of this um, inflation heap faster than what um, than what some of the others have. Oh, sorry, the other growth side. The, in terms of inflation, there's still two the two or three key things for Australia is we're running much higher immigration than any other country. Or you know, ex Canada, I guess, is giving us a run. But you know, most other countries are running, uh, just just aren't running immigration anywhere near ours, and so that's putting a lot more pressure on um, house prices in Australia, which will hold inflation up for a bit longer. Um, it also keeps wages lower, so it's actually the worst type of inflation. So if you're getting, so if you're getting what they're seeing in the US, which is where wages are growing, and therefore um, there's there's this that's spiraling into some some inflation. You know, economists have a bit of a concern about that from, from you know, is that inflation endemic and, and all these things like that. But from a from a person um, within that economy, you know, you're getting wage growth and, and then you're getting inflation and you're getting wage growth and you're getting inflation. And so you, you, you're sort of keeping up or, or in front, whereas Australia's got the opposite problem where we've got this inflation, but we're not getting the wage growth. Um, and then the last part is the energy side. Now, energy prices have come back a long way, but, but you know, Australia's... Uh, Australian politicians have shown that they're not interested in in um, in protecting Australia, uh, you know, in taking advantage of the, of the low prices we have in Australia for energy. They're they're happy to leave us to the mercy of, of international markets, and so um, and so yeah. So we are seeing sort of inflation there that's that's a little bit higher than than um, uh, than, than what it should be. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things came out clearly in that press conference was that a lot of the inflation is homegrown now, a lot of it's service. Yes. A lot of services related, things like well, rents, etc. I don't even et call it self-inflicted. <laughs> well, I, th I think that's exactly right because uh, that was going to be my next con con conversation. It is self-inflicted, and mm. um, the other point, of course, is that um, the actual headline inflation rate is being helped by quite a lot of government handouts, specifically for those in the rental sector and for some of the energy. So if you if you took those away, then the actual true mm. inflation would be quite a bit higher. So, so you know, the, the numbers are not necessarily what the numbers are. You know, she said, well, we're, we're at four point something. And somebody said, mm. well, I, I thought it was three point something. So it depends on how you look at the numbers. But but yeah. it's, it's tricky. The other point I would make is through COVID, relatively speaking, the amount of money that was thrown at the Australian economy by combination of the RBA and the government per capita was a lot bigger than a lot of other countries. So one of my arguments has been for some time, there's, there's probably, there was probably more carry post-COVID mm. in Australia, but that's now running out of runway quite fast because the savings ratio is dropping. So effectively, you know, whilst they can do a, a few things, the fundamental economics of Australia and now I think being challenged, and we'll come onto this later, but of course China is part of the problem there too. Um, interestingly, <laughs> the uh, Cookie Boy put this uh, comment up uh, a little while ago. Let me just pick, pick it up. Hang on. There we go. Um, the RBA released its quarterly statement on Tuesday. Yeah, inflation back in the middle of target, mid-26, was 23, was 24, was 25, now 26. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the problem, right? They keep kicking the end game out. So... The, the longer they keep this this, this sort of story afloat, the, the risk is, of course, that um, higher interest rates grind everybody further 
And she was at pains to make the point that inflation's, you know, a problem. But I would say high interest rates are a problem too. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the question is saying, um, you know, if, we're, if we've got high housing costs, you know, is, 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 does high inflation, does having high interest rates kick that problem, fix that problem? And you go, no, it doesn't. It probably makes it worse, you know, at the margin. At, at some point, um, uh, yeah, and, and it's, so it's tough to get loans and everything, all that type of stuff. If you've got, uh, you know, the, the, that after effect still flowing through from these high energy prices, well, does high does, does having high interest rates going to fix that problem? No, it doesn't make any difference. You know, we're, we've opened ourselves to the world. We're, we're running on world energy prices. And so, um, yeah, so, so you know, that the I, I do feel as if there's still a, 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 a focus that, I'd love to see more in, in terms of actually looking at, at what's what are wages, what's wage growth and what what's real wages doing, um, because you know, real household disposable income is going backwards for um, per per capita on a per capita basis. You know, if we're we're worried about the actual effect on people, human beings, individual human beings living in our our society or in Australia, then um, we're getting you know the opposite effect that that you'd like to see, and so um, yeah. Anyway. That's that's where we are. We, yeah, we are where we are, and I guess the question is, <laughs> where are we going, right? And and so let let's try and break this apart because, of course, one of the remarkable things that we had was a massive run up in markets from late October onwards, um, mm. powered very much by the magnificent seven or six, depending on how you look at it, right? So I think it will be good to spend just a little bit of time exploring the magnificent six. Magnificent seven, as as a way of getting into the, the the big question which I've got, which is, are future earnings expectations justifying the valuations of markets? Because that seems mm. to me now, but to become the really critical question as we go forward. Yeah, that's right. And so, uh, okay, so lots of different ways we can look at this. I guess one of the things to to note is that you know I, I think last time I was here I was talking about how. Uh, 2024 forecast earnings were still way too high. Now that's hasn't completely reversed, but it's come a long way. So we were looking at almost 10% um, growth for for companies um, last time I was on this show, so a month ago. Now that rates uh, a little bit over five percent. Uh, so so earnings have come down, you know, significantly. We've almost all, yeah almost halved our our growth rate in terms of uh, for, for 2024. Right, and, and now, just, to, just to make the point on that, Damien, that's because, mm -hmm. of course, a lot of analysts plug in a sort of a 10% number at the start of their assumptions, right? And then they start yep. getting real data and then they have to sort of tweak them and tune them. So the this, this is yep. unsurprising. But yes. The point is the market pricing, particularly a lot of shares, are probably mm -hmm. over what they should be based on now the current levels of expectations of earnings that we're seeing. Yeah, that's right, and 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 I think I spoke as well that this this tendency of people to go, um, okay, so we're going to we're at ten percent growth in over two years, and you go so I'm starting with a hundred, then I go to one hundred and ten, then they go to one hundred and twenty one, and then they look at the first year and they go the first year is like oh you know it could be a bit disappointing. I'm gonna I'm gonna it's not gonna be ten, maybe it'll only be seven percent. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take three percent. I'm gonna downgrade that from from one hundred and ten to to one hundred and seven, and maybe the 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 next year you know. Might not be as bad. I'll do that from from 121 back to 119, and so it sounds reasonable when they do it. But now what's actually happened is now you're growing from 107 to 119. You're growing by more than 10. percent So you've got this. You, you've factored in this this much higher growth rate for the, the for, from the first year to the second year more because they're just sort of they're trying to downgrade their numbers and they're just not they're, they're looking at the one they can see. And then it's not until they finally they finally report and it comes doesn't come in at 107 it comes in at 105 and they're like oh great i've got that and they look at the next year and go oh oh well now now i've got 15 percent growth forecast for next year that's not going to happen and then they start winding it back and we're in this period now where companies are finally coming in with their 2013 uh, sorry 2023 numbers and so now they now they're looking over the as, as they're reporting they're like oh let me have a look what i've got forecast for next year oh oh wow that's pretty yeah, that, that that isn't going to happen and so, yeah, that's what that's this position we've been in for the last month or so. Where we've really seen those numbers come down, and I, and I think there's, there's further to fall within it. So, um, yeah, so the magnificent seven, they really have, um, you know, in 2023, they really dominated that the, the growth rates. So, um, you know, 2023 numbers are going to come in um, probably 
around about even with the prior quarter, uh, prior, prior year. So, so, so about no growth. But um, if you took out the the uh, magnificent seven, you'd be down, you know, maybe four percent in terms of growth rates. So, um, yeah, they've, you know, we've managed to hold on to exact to where we were last year, but but because of that magnificent seven um, in terms of getting that that great growth rate. So, yeah. um, and, and just to say, you know, there's been a lot of volatility, right? A lot of yes. swings up and down, and some market participants benefit from from that volatility. But it shows you, to my mind, volatility is, a, is an indicator of, you know, uncertainty. What I find fascinating is the VIX itself is still not very um, uh, extended. No, so, it's very so well behaved. A yeah. lot of that volatility is not very reflected in some of the indices that you would have perhaps have expected to see it in. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, so let's let's. Uh, I might start with. Um, I'm going to start with the one, some of the ones that that I think have got the more problem, more problems in in, in the um, Magnificent Seven. Mm. So, if you look at Apple as an example, um, so they're sort of trading on, and 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 actually, just for anyone, so a, a market multiple is usually. So, so I'm going to talk about price to earnings. I'm going to talk about forward price to earnings. So usually you'd expect companies to be trading on somewhere between um, you know, 15 and 18 is, is typical for, for most companies over a longer time period. Um, the better companies will be above that and the worst companies will, will, will trade below that. So Apple's sort of trading on about 28 times, which is pretty expensive and, and more so um, very expensive relative to Apple's recent history. Um, and... And expensive in terms of growth rate, like Apple's, we're expecting single digit growth from them. So it's sort of like 5% growth or 7% growth. Um, they're having problems in China. Um, it's, uh, it's yeah, it's just not the type of company you would expect to, um, you know, be trading on such high multiples relative to the growth that, that it's actually bringing through. So, so yeah, so, so look at Apple and I go, you know, is, is there a bubble in terms of prices? And I think I look at that and go, yeah, well, look, it's certainly expensive. Um, look, I love, you know, love the company, got, um, you know, some great earnings and the earnings are still headed up and, you know, it's and, and they've been pretty solid over the years, but, um, you yeah, know, they are running to problems in China and they, and they do look very expensive. Um, uh, just, the other one you just, just, oh, just, just on, on that, of course, they've just launched the Vision Pro, which is this uh, very expensive, you know, three-dimensional yeah. thing, which potentially yes. has, you know, maybe trajectory down the road, but is probably not going to do a huge amount immediately. It's sort of more sort of strategic positioning. The real question mm. is, to what extent will older iPhone users upgrade? And uh, there are, of course, in China now some competitors that are actually trying to uh, eat some of their lunch too. And uh, yep. some of some of the supplies. And the Chinese government's banning banning uh, their government officials from buying yep. uh, Apple yep. iPhones because of uh, security issues. Yeah, and they also have some some um, supply chain issues too. But of course, mm. a lot of what they are doing is still some of their infrastructure and some of the other bits and pieces. So there is still a base, but the momentum of growth is the question, isn't it? Yeah, and they looked at, and there's a bunch of interesting things that maybe if they get it right, they could. Um, you know, they've got some quite interesting things they're doing on the chip side that they could that that could come in and they could be selling those chips to others. Um, they uh, and, and the you know the design in terms of uh, they were very early onto this idea that um, you, you're much better at, rather than having one um, big chip that's really powerful and and a very generalist chip is actually better off having lots of little, little small chips that are much cheaper. Um, but much more specialized. And so when you when you want to crop a photo or do something with the photo, one it's a different chip than the chip that actually runs your power system the whole time. You know, we can have a much lower power one that keeps your phone alive. And so they're yeah, they're very early in on some of that. They've got some interesting technology. Uh, they're trying to do some stuff on AI chip things, processing. Yeah, maybe maybe something else, maybe something great will fall and 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 I'll be wrong. But um, you know, just based on the 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 forecasts that they, that are coming out. Um, it, yeah, it's that part about always trying to look at companies and say, okay, I, I can really like what they're doing and I can like their their growth prospects, but that doesn't mean I'll pay any price for them. What what, what is the limit of the price that you want to pay for it? And so I'm certainly <laughs> happy to pay value. above market multiple, but yeah, yeah but the question about how far above. And then that's that's sort of uh, that's very much the story for Tesla, which is um, 
you know, a lot of people describe describe in terms of buying is 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 more about a more like a religion than a than a uh, than than doing evaluation is is you know it's always been expensive, um, but they are running into some pretty serious problems uh, and and profitability wise profitability, which you know for years and years and years just went up and up and up, um, has uh, you know for the last year and a half has been falling in terms of forecasts, and so you know the expectation now. You know, uh, well, two or three years ago, well, it's not even two, yeah, mid mid twenty twenty two, people were expecting by twenty twenty four that they'd be earning sort of seven dollars a share, and and that's now that's you know halved in terms of now that it's sort of more like three and a half dollars a share um, for for next year. So uh, China is busy subsidising EVs as fast as they can. Um, you know, we've got Europe talking about whether they're going to be putting. Uh, tariffs on some of the the, the Chinese uh, EVs. Uh, I guess there's debates in in the US about how much they should be subsidised or not subsidised. Uh, there's already a package through that to, you know. Will there be more subsidies for it? Probably not. Um, you know, there's there's certainly issues there in terms of just the the pricing in terms of saying it, it's expensive. It's an, and it's always been expensive, but. Um, uh, yeah, you know, the question for a while there it was valued at at sort of more than the rest of the entire car sector, the entire every other car maker in the world combined. Um, there's a question for these guys that are trading on, you know, 55 times next next year's earnings. And I spoke about sort of the you know market multiples. You you're probably more like 18 ish for 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 companies, sort of like your average. Uh, most of the rest of the car sectors are trading on single digit PEs, so you can buy them for seven times earnings or, or six times earnings if you want to buy um, a traditional car maker, or you can, for almost 10 times more, you can buy Tesla. And so it's a question about going, yeah, you look, you might like Teslas. You might think they're they're much, much better than, than say, Toyota, but are they 10 times better than Toyota in terms of valuation? Or, you know, it, where's it, where's the where's the the limit reached in terms of those? And so yeah, so earnings earnings have not been good out of Tesla for for a while, is it? which is why you're alluding to it being you know maybe it's only the magnificent six and and you, and you showed there the the share price graph you know um, has not been as, uh, as as good as the other ones. So um, yeah, so that's that's the ones that are sort of dragging a little bit. Um, oh, and sorry, the other one was Google. Uh, they came out with um, uh, some numbers that disappointed and, and share price fell uh, quite significantly. Um, Google is basically trading on a market multiple. So it's it's trading at 20 times earnings at the moment, which is sort of pretty similar to what the US market is. Uh, you've got growth rates of 15% per annum sort of forecast for the next two years. Uh, yet certainly earnings have not been as good as... Um, they weren't in, they weren't as good in this latest uh, report as, as what others were expecting as what analysts were expecting, but uh, you know to buy a company on a market multiple at um, that's doing fifteen percent per annum growth is you know not a bad deal generally. You know, the questions that there are some questions about you know ad cycles and you know if the if you go into downturns and, and all that type of stuff. But I guess uh, if you're looking for a bubble. Um, you can sort of see it in Tesla. You can see it in in Apple. Uh, you get to Google, and and um, you know it doesn't look as expensive. Uh, I, guess, I guess there is an argument that says uh, that media companies and mature media companies should trade significantly cheaper. So traditionally, you see um, you know things like your News Corps and and your, your papers. You know, I guess if we if we if we were around twenty years to to sort of when they were the the kings of the the media sector. Um, they would trade on on usually a below market multiple, but um, you know it's it doesn't take much to argue that that you know Google still got some um, uh, still got a pretty reasonable growth sort of factored in. Um, so so yes, so uh, and then the the ones that sort of excited the market were some of the others. So I might talk about Meta now. That's one of our bigger holdings. Uh, so Meta is Facebook. Um, and it's been interesting in that you know I think it's I think it's jump uh, following its result was the the largest ever one day increase in terms of market cap for a company I think um, so it's uh, now it's it's trading on twenty three times earnings 
So it's sort of a little bit above, um, so, so 10 or 10, 15% above uh, what we saw for Google. The only thing, I guess I, lo- I look at Meta in a different way, which is why it's been one of our largest holdings. And the reason why I look at it differently is it's still spending um, a an incredible amount of money on um, the metaverse, which is basically 3D technologies that, to help 3D technology. So, so they're... I guess um, their vision for the world is that uh, you know we went from using um, using dumb phones and texting each other to uh, gradually getting smartphones and then putting social media on and and moving more into videos you know from from texting to 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 interactive websites to videos and then then the next step is going to be three D and and they're trying to get ahead of that now. They might be right. They might not be wrong. Who knows? They are spending an incredible amount of money and making no revenue from it. So if you said tomorrow that they shut down that whole division, they just said, no, you know what? We were wrong. Shut the whole thing down and um, just go on with the rest of their business. That PE would fall from 23 times to 14 times or 13 times. It would make it one of the cheapest stocks in the market. And that's the reason why we've sort of been buying it and holding it in large amounts because um, it, it really comes down to what your view on that metaverse is. Is this thing that's going to just going to be a dragging on their earnings forever? In which case, maybe it looks a little bit expensive. If your view is that this thing is, you know, worth zero, and I should just I'll, I'll separate that out, and, and it's worth some sort of you know, negative cost that eventually they'll they'll make back, you know, roughly what they spent, but it's not actually worth anything. Then this stock looks cheap at current months. And if you've got a view that the metaverse is going to be fantastic and and these guys have got it right and they're you know that they're in on the ground floor and they're going to be the kings of the of the metaverse, then um uh then this stock looks dirt cheap uh, on that basis because you're basically saying, well, you know, that you could take out the, the money they're spending on that and, and treat that as a you know just sort of separate it into the two companies. So uh so yeah, so that, that was one of the more exciting ones. And and I think you know what I'm there's going to be ups and downs and, you know, it's just rocketed, you know, for, um, well, it was up 20% in a day. And, and, you know, so there's, it's had this, some pretty incredible performance, but, um, you know, as a longer term play, I'm, I'm not, not that upset still to, to be a holder of that. And just to make the point, um, they did actually pay their first dividend and they also announced a significant share buyback. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. They're spinning off lots of cash. They've got, yep. yeah, that's, um, yeah. Uh, you know, and some people do have, uh, objections to social media. Um, in terms of saying that you know the uh, what it's doing to people's brains and the world and all that type of stuff like that, and I've you know I've, I have some sympathy. I don't <laughs> I don't think it's so, it's helpful for people, but um, uh, you know they're, they're certainly making money from it, and and uh, there's been uh, uh, plenty of technologies over over the years that everyone said is is ruining your brain and and you know wrecking uh, society and and, and uh, you know everything from. Uh, Moving to television from radio, and well, probably from radio from nothing, and you know, all the way up, all the way up the chain onto computers. Uh, so we did those ones. Uh, Microsoft. Now that one's Microsoft is is interesting. In I've sort of put this one in the middle of of look. It certainly looks like it's in a bubble. It's trading thirty two times um, uh, next year's earnings. So. Uh, it's getting pretty good growth out of that. You're probably going to get 10% growth, um, 10 to 15% growth out of it for the next few years. It's up to its eyeballs in AI. So um, not only does it have you know significant exposure from from um, the uh, um, uh, in terms of to, into Chat GPT and and the associated factors, it's also got lots of int- lots of uh, uh, cloud computing. It's got, um, you know, and pretty much an unassailable position in a whole bunch of different software products uh, that people are just going to buy because. And um, there's one other factor, and, and and there's a potential that maybe maybe they'll actually start making some reasonable inroads into search. You know, uh, they've got you know a lot of their AI driven stuff uh, might. You know, I don't know. If it's, I don't know. What you call it a likely, but it's certainly it's certainly more likely than it was two or three years ago that 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 they can they can make some more headway in terms of search. So, um, and just a uh, a metronome in terms of their earnings just keep rising year after year after year. So, extremely high quality company. Now it's just a question about how much you want to pay for that. Um, it is looking, ex- you know, starting to look expensive. 
Uh, well, not starting to look. It's it's looking expensive, uh, but you're getting very high quality. And so, you know, I, I guess I've got, I have mixed feelings about it <laughs> in terms of where, you know, how it, we're certainly getting close to the point where I'm not adding any more to it, to, to, to our positions and considering whether, whether I need to lighten up on some of the, uh, some of the holdings, I guess is, is where I'm sort of sitting on that. And it's worth just making um, the point, of course, as well as the software they've got there, um, whole cloud computing Azure and those sorts of things, right? Which is actually quite a big contributor of sustained income growth. Yes. And interestingly, yeah. if you link that back to AI, it is the infrastructure that ultimately is it's, the growth engine growing. at the moment. The other stuff may come later with terms of, you know, changing business models and things, but a lot of it's infrastructure mm. at the moment. Yeah. And, my, and I think Microsoft's main problem is that they're so big <laughs> that even that, which is, you know, a major part of their company is just doesn't, it doesn't move the needle enough, I suppose, in yep. terms of, you know, they, they're they probably, yeah, you can rack out 20, 30% growth, uh, earnings growth in terms of that, those sectors, but then it gets sort of, um, because it's such a huge company uh, that sort of gets, um, you know, spread out sort of over mm. th three trillion in, in market cap. So, um, yeah, you need to, uh, you really need to grow really, you yeah, know, get some quite significant growth um, to make that, um to make that show up. Now, um, did want to talk NVIDIA? Have I missed anyone? I, test, I did Tesla, well, didn't I? Talk Amazon. Amazon. Oh, sorry, that's but, yes. That, that was who I wanted to talk next, yes. Do you want to Amazon first or NVIDIA first? Uh, Amazon first. Amazon first. Now, Amazon is very much a company as well. We need to look at it three ways. Um, it's got three different divisions within it. It's got uh, a... It's got Amazon.com, the, the the retail website, and I split that into two, either the international and the American side. Now, the international side doesn't make any money. It's never made any money. It's um, maybe they'll get it right, um, but, you know, they've been at it for a long time and it basically breaks even. doesn't really lose much. You know, but um, never really makes much either. So, so maybe there's a bit of an option there. But, but you know, if that was trading on its own, it wouldn't be worth that much. The US part of the Amazon is this really interesting part where uh, it makes a massive amount of sales and it makes tiny razor thin margins. And because the margins are so small, you know, if that moves from a 0.3 margin one. Uh, quarter to a 0.6 margin another quarter, you know, it's only, a, it's only they've only changed by 0.3%. Well, they've just doubled their profit from that division. <laughs> and so they go through these bits where, and, and people, uh, you know, the, the, there's a common argument going, well, some stage they'll stop going for growth and they can normalize their margins and put them back up closer to what other retailers make. And these, these things can be worth a mozza. Maybe. They've been around for a long time with a growth model. Um, there, maybe there's questions about whether they can do it or not. You know, if they put prices up too far, um, they're certainly going through a phase at the moment where they're, they're, their margins are expanding and they're actually starting to make some reasonable margins in, the, in that division. Uh, and that's part of the, why we saw this big pop. Now, the question is, how sustainable is that? Um, so, uh, yeah, but yeah, anyway, I guess there's this, you sort of go, got the, the international division I probably don't want to pay much for. I've got the American one, which is a dominant, online retailer, it's absolutely worth something. It's actually worth a, lot, worth a lot of money. Just the question is saying, is it worth um, a lot more than because, it, because it's got this, this latent earnings that it's, not, that it's not taking advantage of, or is it just worth a little bit more because actually, you know what, it'll just never be able to make the same margins that, that, other, that other ones make. Um, and then you have this rocket ship, which is AWS, so the, the uh, Amazon Web Services, and that's cloud computing and it's, you know, they're the leader, um, they uh, that just grows year after year after year. Yeah, they had a few disappointing quarters where they only grew at fifteen percent rather than twenty five percent, like that scene. And so you know, um, uh, and and so you sort of strap these three things together, and you're like, right, how much do you want to pay for this? <laughs> now the AWS part, yeah, you want to pay a lot for that. That's growing. It's got, you know, it's just it makes fantastic margins. You know, so so we're talking about, you know margins in the um uh in their retail bit you know sub one percent in terms of what you what you're pulling out in terms of profits uh in terms of profitability in the aws you're talking over 50 percent so you know it's just chalk and cheese in terms of what you're getting from it um 
And so, uh, yeah, so so how much do you want to pay for it? And so you, you're paying um, even on sort of quite improved numbers, like or not quite improved numbers, dramatically improved numbers, you're paying um, 40, 50 times for, or maybe so maybe 40 times for 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 um, their earnings. So, you know, 2026 numbers forecast for 2026 went from, you know, before um, the end of the year, they were trading at sort of, people were expecting them to make $4.50 a share. Now they're expecting them to make $7 a share. So you've, you haven't quite doubled your profits, but, you know, you're up 70% or something like that in terms of the, the increase in, in, in what people are expecting. And it's still trading on 40 times. <laughs> you know, you still double the market multiple. And so, um, you know, they've spoken a little bit about spinning it out, spinning out the, the AWS, and that would be really, that would be very interesting in trying to work out then, you know, if you look at a other online businesses and what they trade at and then versus, versus AWS. So um, I can sort of do some numbers that if I look sideways and sort of glance up, glance upwards, the glass sort of looks half full, but um it's uh, it's always expensive, um, and then it's just a question about when, yeah, you know, what's the right multiple to pay for three very different businesses with very different growth profiles and very different um, margins within it. So, yes. And just a quick comment on uh, that. Of course, they did start um, putting adverts in their um, Prime subscriptions. Yes, yes, that's right. So, yeah, well, that, that's right. You've got Prime, which is you know an afterthought in a way, relative, and and it's that whole part about the Amazon. Their sales is so massive that this is, uh, you, know, you can start up a whole division like that, and it, it barely makes a dent in the in the profitability because um, they're, they're just you know so huge in terms of their sales. Yeah. Uh, and then the last one, Nvidia. So, um, it's all about uh, how much growth you see within the AI sector, and how much you think they'll be able to take now. They are growing at a at an incredible rate, and I think they are going to keep going and growing at an incredible rate. And they're not they don't look given their growth profile, so they're going to they're going to be um, they're looking at uh, you know so if, so if you drew back say if you looked at the average they earned uh, from you know twenty seventeen to twenty twenty one for example, you'd say they they earn about a dollar fifty a share say. Um, they're looking like earning twenty dollars plus a share um, over the next couple of years. So it has been an incredible increase in terms of the uh, in terms of profitability. Uh, you know, the sales are sort of doubling. Uh, so that's 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 the good side. Now the bad side of it is they are in an industry which is a very nasty industry. As I, as I was talking to you before, Martin, um, it's. Whoever, there's not a lot of brand loyalty uh, from the from the big guys. I'm talking because they, they're selling to data centers. So if you've got the best chip, uh, the data centers will buy from you. And um, yeah, they'll they'll probably keep something. You know, even if you haven't got the best chips, you, they'll keep something because they they like to keep a few companies alive and spending money on on R and D and all that type of stuff. They don't want to end up in monopoly situations. But uh, you've got to keep coming up with the greatest hits. Now, NVIDIA looks like they've got a pretty reasonable gap between them and everyone else, but uh, Google's working on chips, Apple's working on chips, Amazon's working on chips, uh, AMD's working on chips, Intel's working on chips, you know, half of China's working on chips. There's, you've got people out there spending a lot of money to try and catch you. So so that's, that's one part of it. Um, second part of it is last year, on all data centers, um, there was about 200 billion spent. Now we know that's going to increase a lot, but the forecasts basically have for AMD, sorry, not for AMD, for NVIDIA in over the next two or three years, or sorry, in the next two years, making up over hundred billion dollars in sales. So they're basically doing, so if you think about a data center, <laughs> um, uh, there you got to buy all the, you got to get all the electricity. You got to have the people working in it. You got to get all the you know clean rooms, and you got to get all the power. You've got to get uh, computers. You've got to get memory for those computers. You've got to get uh, hard disks for those computers. Like there's all these things you need to get, and we're looking at basically saying uh, these guys are going to sell. These guys are going to make a uh, hundred billion dollars or over a hundred billion dollars out of a out of something that last year was was in total was spending two hundred billion dollars. So. Um, 
Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. They're going to have to keep 90 plus percent market share of, of what they're doing. Plus, you're going to have to get this incredible growth, which, and I think, do think a lot of that incredible growth will probably come through and no competitors will have to come up. And the problem I spoke about that being this sort of this nasty industry is that there's, when you look at um, uh, Intel and all these other chip makers, AMD and, and these others that have been the leaders at certain times in, in the latest and greatest chips, traditionally, uh, people will only pay, won't pay up for it. You don't pay these massive multiples for it. You, t- you pay sort of 10 to 15 times earnings for it because you got to keep producing that chip every single year. It's it's much harder to and it's much easier for people to switch um, from you know they stop buying your chip and start buying somebody else's because it's because the other one's better or cheaper, and so um, uh, yeah so they're in this sweet spot now where everyone wants AI everyone wants to put it on as fast as they can, but um, uh, you know they, they, it's there they've got a lot of down they've got a lot they could possibly lose and they they don't even have to lose that much for for those multiples to come back. And and people stop paying thirty five times earnings for them and start paying fifteen times that that they that they usually would. Um, and the other and the other thing to get to note as well is they don't do any of the manufacturing. So all the manufacturing is done by um, TSMC, which is a or not all of it, but most of it's done by TSMC or or others like that, global foundries. And so if somebody else does come up with a a better chip or even just a similar chip, but that's much cheaper, uh, they can they can get that they can get those produced like. Nvidia managed to scale up its its production so quickly, not because if it had its own factories, you know, we would have been talking about a five year cycle where they built the factories and then tried to get them up. They just basically went to uh, TSMC and says, "Hey, can you turn on all these extra lines?" And TSMC said, "Went went well. If we're going to make, if it's going to be double the profitability of our other customers, absolutely, we'll turn them all on." And, and they could very easily do that for um for for a competitor product or something that's you know a, a chip that's better or cheaper or or whatever it is, some sort of combination of the two. So um, yes, so looks good. Um, if you if everything goes right, then they're probably um, yeah, yeah. You can you can make an argument that that might be all right buying them here if if they get everything exactly right and it all lines up. But it's got to be perfect. You got to thread that needle, and um, uh, yeah. So I'm yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stand in the way of that one. I certainly wouldn't be shorting it, um, but. It's uh, it it does look pretty expensive for for what it for what it's actually doing, and at some point it'll come back to earth in terms of at some point it, that yeah that that growth will slow and and you'll you'll see it trade on more like ten to fifteen times like like all those chip guys do. And I suppose that, you know Cookie Boy asked the question is is Nvidia overpriced, which is part of the question. But I guess the other part of my question is to what extent is this a mirror image of the dot com bubble in the two thousands? You know, are yeah. we seeing a similar significant run up and overhype? Uh, you know, yeah. it, are they going to come back, or is there enough reality here that this time is different? What do you think? Yeah, well, my my favorite um, comparison is uh, is Cisco. Is so Cisco uh, produces routers, which basically you know devote you know, they uh, when when you send out. Uh, messages on your computer, it basically takes it and, and diverts it wherever it needs to go. And they're really high quality. They're um, uh, you know, very much was always seen as, as as one of the best companies out there. If you look at their earnings profile uh, from the from the dot com boom, it's it looks great. It's just this forty five degree line. It just goes up and up and up and up every single year. You just get more and more earnings out of them. From a fundamental perspective, they've done everything that you tick every box. But if you bought them in the tech boom, um, you would still be down on them today in terms of profits. So it's this question about how much do you want to pay for that? So from a fundamental perspective, their earnings increased. They're, I think they're probably up 10 times, maybe yeah, at least five times in terms of earnings. Um, but share price has fallen because it just got so expensive. Now, uh, NVIDIA is not there, that not quite at that same massive uh, price, but um, it's it's in it's it's playing it's playing the same ball game, yeah. So it, it's it's it does look expensive. You do need to use some really aggressive forecasts, and you need to assume that they're just going to make um, they're going to stay at ninety percent plus market share, and um, yeah, could happen. But but seems uh, yeah, seems unlikely. Okay. 
And just on that, here is the long-term Cisco story, right? So you can see there yes. that the, you know, the price hit a peak of uh, about eighty back in the year two thousand, and we're now at um, at forty-nine. So I guess the question is, is it legitimate to say that we are somewhere in the slopes here, right? With yeah, regard. we're on the way up. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, that's right. You could justify. I can, I can certainly see where we could justify the current price, you know, in five years' time. Mm. But I can see lots of scenarios where. They might fall back to 50% market share or 60%. They might be the dominant player in the market. Um, but they're just not, they're no longer, you know, they're no longer getting 90% market share and they revert back to a more, more market, more normal market multiple, and the share price is down 30, 40% from where it is today. Yeah. And and, and so that's yeah. And, and, and so and just ca- go on. I know, I was just gonna say you would you'd look at objectively if you looked at them and went. Um, they will be making way if they, if they're in that position in three years' time, they're gonna be making way more money than they are today. You know, keeping 60% market share in one of the biggest markets is is a great success. You know, they're still a good company. Everything's they're still doing everything right. It's just a question about how much you want to pay for that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, just going back to where we came into this conversation, the broader index is up, but about 30% of the index is now represented in these six or seven shares, right? So, yes. so, so, if those stocks are going so strongly, what does that say about the broader market? Yeah, well, it says what the, the when you look at the equally weighted indexes, um, yeah, you get a you get a much more uh, sanguine picture about about um, whether markets are rising or not. Uh, and, and we spoke about the earnings elsewhere. So, you know, earnings for um, if you're not part of that, uh, you know, you, you pretty much halved your earnings for uh, for other. Have your any growth rate? Sorry, um, uh, yeah. And so the, then the question is: Is this um, you know is it going to get better over twenty twenty four or is it going to get worse? And so um, uh, I still find listening in on company announcements there, there seems still to, and there's certainly a lot more. We're seeing a lot more earnings downgrades, uh, but there still seems to be that factor of. People still saying they they think they're going to keep getting their sales growth, but they think their their costs are all going are all going to go away. That's that's the large, you know. If you if you're looking for the a positive story, is that companies are basically saying, yeah, look, our costs are all falling or or, or flat. You know, with that that inflationary burst we had, we don't have to worry about, and so we'll put through our sales growth, and then but our costs won't be anything, and and we'll make this, you know, this is what our profit growth is going to be. And it sounds all right until you actually think, take a big step back and go, well, yeah, but my costs are somebody else's revenues. And so if everyone's saying the same thing that, you know, their costs, their costs are uh, their costs are falling or flat, but they're going to put their sales up, then everyone can't be right. So mm. yeah. It's a question about who's which are the people that are wrong in, in that. And just on the equal weight, this is just the uh, equal weight ETF for um the US. And what you can mm. actually see there is that it actually was higher in 2022 than it is now. So that's an interesting object lesson, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And th- and this is a question. And so so I've spoken before about saying quality stocks is where I think if you're investing, look for the, look for quality stocks. And what, what do I mean by that? Is I mean that when you get inflation, it gives companies a chance to put prices up. And now some companies don't get prices chances to put prices up very often at all. So say uh, car companies or, or tire manufacturers or um, you know, sort of more commodity type goods that where you've got lots of competition, they go through these whole cycles where they just can't put their prices up or they, or they have to cut their prices every year. And then suddenly we get this burst of inflation and they can all put prices up and it's fantastic for them. And, they're, and, they, and, they're, and they're, they're your value stocks and not your high quality stocks because they don't have big margins. They don't have these wide moats. And, that, and so things are great while they while inflation's going up. When inflation's falling, though, they're the ones that have to put their prices down, and they're the ones where you get price wars break out, and they start they all start trying to um, you know they they've all just built new factories because they're making these great margins, and so then they want to fill up their factories, and so they're all trying to get more volume through, and they and and they're forcing prices down, and and there's so many competitors that there's not the same discipline. So what you're trying to say, what I'm trying to say is 
trying to avoid those companies, the ones that did really well as, as inflation was rising and not the same companies that are going to do well in, in the falling inflation environments. You want the companies that are largely sort of um, monopolies or, or oligopolies and they're put through price rises, but they're probably going to be able to hold on to them and maybe even put prices higher. So, um, you know, I look at a company like a Microsoft, you know, they put through price rises for, for things like their office products. Um, maybe that'll fall away if businesses, you know, start dropping back. But chances are Microsoft's not cutting their prices. They're not looking at it going, yeah, if, if we just cut our prices by 5%, we'll sell all these extra um, uh, copies. They're looking at it going, it's a sunk cost. You know, company's going to pay for it if they've got somebody sitting there. And so, um, yeah. It's uh, you want companies that are going to be able to hold on to those those price rises. So, so the higher quality companies, bigger margins, um, yeah, you know, bigger moats, as as Warren Buffett would say. So I guess the question then is, you know, if you look at the let's say the S P five hundred in the U S. just as an example, right? So we're touching new time, you know, all time highs at the moment. Um, mm. But you'd have to argue a lot of that is driven by those six or seven stocks. Um, yep, the broader economy. Um, maybe a little less strong than um, perhaps um, people were expecting. The interest rates will probably be higher for longer. So are we really in a point in the cycle where markets are now overvalued? Uh, they certainly look expensive. Yeah, they look, uh, they're sort of at, at the, uh, um, you'd say they're close to uh, the 80th percentile, I think, in terms of pricing. So, uh, they're not extreme, but they're for for the growth rate that we're looking at, they're, they're right up there. So the, the the times where we've been higher than what than where we are today, um, in the last say thirty odd years was uh, during the tech boom, and as we came out of COVID. So two two times you've had markets that were more expensively priced than, than today. Now the benefit of those two times was there was growth, or at least in a, you know whether there was. There was at least an expectation of growth. It's certainly in the so in in the tech boom, there was growth at the start, and then as things were taking off, there was this expectation that yeah, okay, um, I'm paying up multiples, you know, thirty times for earnings or something like that. But on on average, but um, the markets are growing so quickly that uh, that can justify that thirty times. Coming out of COVID was a similar story. You're paying up sort of 22, 24 times earnings. Um, you could justify it by actually we've just come out of COVID, we're growth boom, um, you know all these earnings, you know pricing power. You can justify that that from a from a yeah. So if you start on twenty four times earnings and you grow at twenty percent, well now I'm below twenty percent, now I'm below twenty times earnings. So you know, you're sort of more back to normal. So the question now is, you know, are we willing to pay top dollar for a market that's looking like it's going to grow at? Um, well, at the moment, the, the growth forecast in the last month and a half has just gone from 10% to, to 5%. Mm. Uh, and, and I would expect it to end up probably pretty close to zero for 2024. Uh, the, the, the half full version is that, look, there's actually a lot coming up, coming down the pipeline over the next few years. So if you look forward past this year and out to the, the following year or the year after, then you can see some growth rates and all that sort of stuff. But um, you're going to have to get some pretty good growth Ideally, look, I'd love to get a chance to buy buy at a cheaper rate. I'd love to see a pullback and and um, you know as as earnings fall. Um, but you know, we I guess if we look at the last um, you know the last six weeks, we saw you know the growth rate almost halve and uh, not a lot of movement on the prices. So um, yeah, it might be <laughs> we might need things to be a fair bit worse, I guess, in order to get the market to pull back. Yeah, and I guess the point is, you know, being in the market is being in the market, right? So you've got to try and make the best of what you know, whatever's going on, right? Which is yeah. a, an important point. Um, now, just let me put this one up because um, uh, Phoenix, thank you very much, Super Chat. You asked for the Pfizer chart, which I'm happy to show you, um, and you can see there that it hit a peak in 2022, and it's um, it's come back down. Uh, in fact, a number mm. of the, a number of the um, stocks in the same um, sector are actually now are significantly down from where they were, and it shows yes. you. Yes. That actually, you know, it's interesting. Again, when you start decomposing the market and looking at, um, you know, individual sectors and individual stocks, the sectors are actually all over the board. Yeah. Now, and that's, I mean, I, I think I spoke, I don't know if I spoke to you last time, maybe the time before about 
um, healthcare and and our take on healthcare is that uh, these obesity drugs uh, that are out could really be game changers for that sector mm. in terms of there is a lot of diseases where if you're 10 kilos lighter, um, a lot of the problems go away. You know, whether you're talking about hip replacements, sleep apnea, um, high blood pressure, you know, you just diabetes, you just go through all these different factors where, you know, if you can get, if there's a reliable way of getting people to, to lose weight, um, that actually uh, gets rid of a lot of the medical problems. And so, um, yeah, so we've got a lot of the, um, a lot of those obesity drugs that we, we, we hold. Uh, and then on the flip side though, we've actually been trying to get underweight most of the rest of the sector with a view that, look, uh, if overall health costs are going down, then um, because you're just having fewer, fewer extreme cases, uh, if that's your sort of outlook for the next, I don't know, five years, um, then uh, then it's probably not that good for the uh, the healthcare sector. Absolutely, and- flip, that that might be a reasonable jumping point off into some of the thoughts on because that sort of uh, fills in for uh, the arc fund. That's- yeah, no, let's, let's talk about ARC because, of course, um, uh, Kathy Woods. Do you want to pull is- up that chart as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah that's I can do that. Chart. Yeah. yeah, okay. You, you lead off. I'll pull the chart up in a second. Yeah, so so I've just uh, uh, so there's this fund out there called ARC, which is the Kathy Wood Fund, and uh, it got a lot of, you know, uh, it gets, it gets a, it's got very diverse opinions upon them, whether, whether it's all a scam or whether um, – yeah, you know, or or whether yes, she truly is um, a, a visionary for the future and things like that. So, my Sorry, pull the chart just to just checking. Are we going to talk about the innovation, the innovation ETF? Is that the right one? Yeah. She, yep. She's got innovation a few. ETF. All right. All right. There you go. So yep. that's the that's the story of the Arc Innovation ETF. Yeah. So coming out of COVID, I think into that we had this massive boom. While you know they were the kings and and everyone loved them, and then. Uh, and then it all went away, and, and everyone spoke about how how they were idiots and and all that type of stuff. So um, every year they put out a um, uh, so, so some reports on innovation, and and they're quite. I actually I agree with a lot of the stuff they talk about. Uh, there's some I, I vehemently disagree with, but but I think their problem, for my part, is largely that they've they've been price insensitive. So their argument has been, you know, whatever it is, that they've been the ones buying. The, the equivalent of um, Cisco at, at you know eighty dollars and and yeah Cisco's been great you know they, they, they like they, they talk about oh here's Cisco it's great it's his you know building block of the internet and it's, and it's you know its earnings going to double and triple and quadruple and they were right you know but they paid so much for it that it lost money and it's that's so so um, yeah so anyway but but I do think it's worth coming back because they, they usually have you know a bunch of quite interesting charts that sort of just talking about what what they're seeing. And um, a number of the things which they uh, they factor in are um, are the ones I like. So I've got a well, I've got their, their five sort of big themes they're talking about. Um, now, artificial intelligence is is at the centre of it, uh, and what you know. So so that's certainly a big growth centre for the next little while. The question is where where can you make money from that? And at the moment, yes, you can make money in in Nvidia. Um, you can make some money in the cloud computing. But in the end, um, for me, it's that's the, the real result will be this sort of productivity in sectors where um, uh, where you weren't expecting to see productivity. So, or sorry, productivity in sectors are much more broader across the economy. And so, there's been a number of things about uh, programming speed. About um, and if anyone out there is a programmer and hasn't been using ChatGPT to um, to help along, um, uh, you should start. Or, or, or Bard actually has got much better in its uh, most recent um, iteration, and so uh, and that and then and then a lot of consultants as well. I saw so those are two uh, some of the two industries they picked on was um, uh, and, and not to denigrate consultants too much, but um, because there are definitely some consultants who do very good jobs, but there's also consultants who uh, are, might be employed by governments like ours where they're told what the answer is and. Can you please work back to, you know, work out what the questions we need to ask so that we get this answer? So we have a predisposition to saying we want to build whatever this is, whatever this road is or railway is. Can you work out the the assumptions and the wording to get there? And, and ChatGPT is pretty good at that stuff because it doesn't need to be right. It just needs to sound convincing. 
Um, and so, uh, yeah, so you don't need to tell, you know, you, you, your 23 year old graduate, go and write me 10 pages on, on why I should fire a bunch of people and give management big, big, big pay rises. I can just ask chap GP to do the same thing for me and then fix it. Um, and so, yeah, so, so I do think there's a, there's a productivity wave in a whole bunch of industries, not every industry, but the, in a whole bunch of industries. And the other part is that, um, it's democratizing a lot of this, uh, a lot of the artificial intelligence. So, so artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. Uh, a lot of the things that are being done in in uh, artificial intelligence uh, by Chat GPT were absolutely available, um, you know, a year, two years, three years ago. In terms of being able to do a lot of these things, but you needed to know uh, a lot about it, and you needed to be able to program in whatever languages, and you needed a lot more. Um, uh, yeah, a, a lot more knowledge and and education to get there, and so only a very small amount of people could do it. Whereas now, uh, these these large language models are democratizing a lot of this and letting you know, not anyone, but a lot of people, um, you, you know, access to be able to do these. So that's one part. So I'm certainly fully on board with that. Um, multiomic sequencing. So the cost to gather a sequence and and understand biological data has fallen dramatically. Um, so sort of giving us all this access to DNA and RNAs. And, and so uh, the question is, you know, are we going to see a lot more tailored um, uh, tailored drugs? Are we going to see a lot more uh, because of part of the AI sort of intersection is there is that if you're giving uh, researchers who are, who are quite knowledgeable but but weren't AI experts, if you're giving them access to tools now where they can run um, much more analysis than what they used to do and 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 interpret data at a, at, a, at a higher level does that mean that they're going to make some more breakthroughs and you know there seems to be some reasonable odds that you you, you get some answers there um robotics um particularly through the on uh you know onshoring and and um and and uh again access to ai and more tools to better more people to being able to program these things um is uh, makes a lot of sense they highlight some of the 3D printing and reusable robots as being some of the big ones. And, and you know, uh, the reusable robots I haven't done a lot with. I do think there's something coming. I don't know if it's imminent um, in terms of the, the the economic breakthroughs there, but it's certainly one sort of worth watching. Uh, and 3D printing, again, is a cost factor, which it's uh, every year 3D, the cost of 3D printing comes down. And so it used to be, um, uh, well, actually, sorry, let me put it another way. We're a long way away from um, you wanting to. You, you can you can you can three D print say cheap toys, uh, uh, but they're way more expensive than than you know buying it in China and shipping it over and, and and that type of stuff. At the moment, it's still expensive parts that are that are worth three D printing, and that's going to um, you know as that cost continues to come down over time. It's going to gradually each, you'll get to the stage where you know, it's, right now it's really expensive parts and it'll become expensive parts and then it'll be moderately expensive parts and and eventually you'll end up with, um, uh, yeah, more, more broadly. But that's that's a trend which has um, uh, certainly been slower than some of the other ones. So, yeah. Uh, energy storage is a huge one. So, uh, and, and that's the one I, particularly when it comes to electric vehicles, um it's worth noting very much that an electric vehicle today for me is uh, makes economic sense if you're doing 50,000 kilometers a year or more. If you're doing close to 100,000, absolutely, you should be investing in, you should be, um, well, depending upon your charging cycles and all that making fits. But, you know, if you're, say, running, uh, you know, 100, a couple hundred kilometers a day, uh, you know, in a, uh, in, a, in a similar route every time and you know where you can charge and, and all that type of stuff you charge at the end of the day and so you're doing 200 kilometers a day and you get to recharge then yeah absolutely they make way more sense than than uh, petrol vehicles but um for the average person doing 10 12 thousand kilometers a year they don't but those battery costs are coming down every year and um, they look like you know probably halving again over the next five years and so that then suddenly opens up a lot more um Opportunities, and we're seeing China spend a lot of doing a lot in terms of subsidies in that area. Yeah, so that's those ones, and then public blockchains. I've got less excitement about the public block blockchains. So, but if you're a Bitcoin fanatic and you want to, you know, jump on and have a look at, at what they're saying, I uh, I support the blockchain technology. I think it's great. I think there there are definitely uses. Um, sometimes, though, blockchain can be seen as a uh 
you know, if, if I already have a central database and I, and I trustworthy and, and you know in in multiple locations or whatever it is, and somebody that I trust to to manage that, then maybe creating a blockchain and and all the extra overhead that goes with it might not actually be worth it relative to to storing it um, centrally. But um, and it might it it is quite highly possible a lot of the stuff they're talking about in terms of blockchain will be successful, but it won't be Bitcoin that actually or or, or Ethereum that actually um, uh, benefits from it. It'll be the same technology, but just used in a different way. Um, so uh, some of the things I just liked, though, some of the, the graphs that I liked. So ChatGPT getting to 100 million users. They've got this how long various platforms took. Um, so Facebook took for, sort of four years to get to 100 million. Uh, YouTube took um, a little bit under four years. Uh, Instagram did it in, in uh, two years. TikTok did it in about a year and a half. WeChat did it in under a year. And ChatGPT GPT did it in, in a couple of months. So um you know, on a, on a growth scale, uh, it looks um, yeah, it looks it's it's very impressive in terms of the amount of the amount of growth they've got. Um, we spoke about cars a little bit before in Tesla. Uh, there's an interesting chart they've got. Uh, so if you look at the cost of owning a personal car um, in 2020 dollars, uh, it basically hasn't changed. Didn't change for uh, you know almost 100 years. So. In 1871, uh, they estimate that a, uh, a horse and cart was going to cost you about a dollar seventy per uh, per mile. Uh, by 1934, you're driving cars for seventy cents a mile. Uh, by 2016, you're still paying seventy cents per mile, and they're looking by 2030 some of these autonomous driving um, ones to be at twenty five cents. So, um, you know, even if they're wrong by a factor of Two, like they're out by double, you know, the, the cost is double what they think it is. It's still a pretty reasonable decrease in terms of uh, the cost of um, uh, running a car. Now, what would it mean if if they're right and that um, autonomous cars do expand is that there's about 100 million cars um, done every year and they're doing about 10,000 kilometres each. If you instead have... Uh, autonomous cars, which are doing seventy to one hundred thousand kilometers a year, then basically you can retire six out of seven cars. You just don't need to produce them because um, these autonomous cars will do. You know, you, people will need to drive a certain distance. Maybe they'll drive further, but but yeah, it still means you can get rid of a whole bunch of the cars. So um, that's a key one. I'd be well. I'm certainly keeping a, a very close eye on. Um, uh, yeah. I noted that. I'm trying to think what other ones. There's a few other interesting charts. We might jump to the. I'm just noticed, noting the time, though, Martin. Maybe I'll bring a few more back for next time on that one, and we can. Um, sure. Well, let's let's jump do back that because otherwise we'll run out of run out of room. Yeah, yeah we're running out of runway. So, but I guess before we close, let's just touch on China briefly, right? So, um, mm. obviously, we had the China Evergrande, um, you know, uh, legal case in in Hong Kong, which um, the question, of course, is to what extent will it be relevant for the main operating units in China? Right, but the, the markets yeah. are, are are a bit so, fr a bit frozen out. Um, they announced overnight that they're going to actually uh, one of the, I think one of the uh, government entities is going to buy more bonds. Um, they've yeah. thrown relatively small amounts at the problem more broadly of the um, Chinese economy at the moment, and yep. um, there does seem to be some willingness to you know allow property markets to sort of uh, go sideways or down. But we also also note that a number of the completions of those many many millions of um, outstanding has now been transferred from some of these building construction companies to government entities to try and actually get them completed. So it's a real mess. And and remember that only a relatively small amount of the the bonds are actually internationally. So a lot of it's actually in China itself. But the broader question is: Is this the antecedent to a more significant set of pressures on the Chinese economy, and does that have a, fl a blowback then to the Australian economy? Yeah, and, and so I guess the first question comes, which I don't know the answer to, is um, you know, was this Hong Kong court how independent was it in terms of its like it, it's basically just applying the rule of the law, really? Um, which I, the question is whether the Chinese government wanted them to apply the rule of the law, and I, I suspect they didn't. But um, 
you know, uh, actually, I'll take one step back and, and talk a little bit about Evergrande and Country Garden and some of these are ones that are having problems. Um, in some of the prior shows, for anyone sort of listening in who, who didn't listen to some of them, was um, uh, sorry, that graph's not not relevant, but <laughs> yeah, push, push some the, the uh, yeah, but some of the um, the prior ones. I pulled up the top 20 in terms of the, uh, the the developers and looked at their debt ratios, how much they have on their books still to produce where they've taken the money but haven't built it yet, how much they've already built but haven't sold, which is which is which is which is different in the in so far as you might have sold you know 50 apartments in a in something in a in a, an apartment building you're building. And, but I've still got another fifty. I've got to sell once it's once it's complete. And so the the fifty have prepaid. So I've got to I've got to build it for them. But then I'm, I'm stuck with these apartments. I can't sell on the other side. So anyway, so if you look through all those different measures and how they're not paying suppliers and they're not paying employees and all that type of stuff like that, and you, and you line up Evergrande and Country Garden versus the other top twenty developers, you can't tell who they are. Like just looking at the lines on the chart, there's not these massive lines out that go, oh, look how much debt these guys have compared to everyone else. They've all got lots of debt. They've all got lots of projects they need to complete that, that where they've taken the money already but haven't finished it. They've all got these unsold, all these unsold properties sitting on their book where they've completed stuff but haven't actually managed to sell the, sell the properties yet. They've all not paid suppliers. They've all not paid employees. Like they're sort of running it sort of, some of them are running it sort of six months late in terms of paying their, their bills. Um, it's endemic in the sector. And so what, what my thesis is on it is that that entire sector is effectively government-owned. Now, the government probably doesn't want to really own it, but they just want to keep this thing alive so that, so that it doesn't bring the rest of the economy crashing down. And um, uh, I'll use a, uh, a – there's a, an interesting example in Japan called TEPCO, which is the, uh, the, the um, company which owned the Fukushima um, – uh, nuclear power plant where they, they had meltdown and, and lost the rods and all that type of stuff like that. And basically what would happen is every year, and I think it's, I haven't actually looked recently, but I think it's uh, probably still happening, um, is that every year the government basically transfers a bit more money across to this thing and keeps them alive. Um, and so uh, whereas the... Um, uh, and you sort of go, well, why would they do that? Why have we got this company that keeps losing money and then the government just transfers enough to keep them alive? And it's, well, the government doesn't want to own this. It's much much better to have some private entity owning it. You know, it's literally a nuclear waste dump, but at least we can blame somebody else and we just keep them alive and so we can keep blaming them for it. And I think I look at the, the, um, the Chinese property market in a similar way. Yeah. It's a, it's, we've had, we're going to have this nuclear meltdown and or we're having this nuclear meltdown and the government wants to keep, you know, wants to be able to blame someone for it. You don't want to take blame if you if you took over all these things and did all the projects yourself. Now you're taking blame for it. Whereas if you leave these companies there, you can sort of tut 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 those naughty those, those naughty companies who borrowed all that money when we kept on encouraging them and then and then didn't magically get it all back when we told them to stop. You know, look at them; it's all their fault. But in the meantime, they're they're giving them just enough money to keep them alive, keep these things building until they've built enough of the property that they can then, yeah. Pull a pin and, and 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 pull out. So yeah, so I'm I'm treating that whole sector as being state owned. I suspect well, and I, and I think this is a great example of exactly what I said. You know, court comes out and says this thing's going to go bust, and then we get start getting these announcements about oh maybe we're just going to tip in enough money so that to keep this thing ticking over and building stuff so that um you know the the whole um the whole jenga tower doesn't come tumbling down. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just worth interesting, you know, thinking about the consequences. So this is actually the um, rebar futures from um, from China, right, which is, you know, the, the end result of all the steel, right? And yep. it, you can see there that we had a peak of um, of 6,000. We're now at sort of, a, you know, 3,838. 3, 3, um, mm. Now, that movement's significant, right? Because, of course, the question is, what does it mean for the future demand for our own exports in Australia? Um, particularly, of course, yeah. because so much of what we are shipping is shipping to China. And, yes. um, you know, the steel price has been wobbling around a bit. It went down and that's come up a bit and that's down slightly more. Um, but if, in fact, the property sector continues to slow, and as you say, they continue to complete some of the stuff that actually is there, and I think there's another two years or so of, of completions to come. But new starts are way, mm. way down, tanks, which, yeah. which means future demand is probably going to crash. Yeah, so it must have been. I, I mean, I've always had worries, problems with the the numbers you get out of these starts because, uh, 
theoretically, when you look at it, you should be able to say, okay, how much have they got building under construction at the moment? And then how much do they complete? Uh, how, much, how many of those complete? And then how many new starts do you get? And those numbers should add up, you know? So I have a, whatever is a billion, whatever is under construction. You know, I add a hundred million, I, I finish 150 million. Well, I should go from a billion to 950. You should be able to make those numbers sort of add up. And they don't, they're out by miles. <laughs> and I went through six months ago, I, I sort of thought, oh, look, I'm going to go through and find, am I stupid or am I just, and I went through and spoke to a whole bunch of China experts on it. And they all had the same comment, which was, no, the numbers, just, you're right. The numbers don't add up. They, didn't, they don't make sense. Um, there is obviously, there's probably a lot of double, um, double announcements in terms of, okay, we started this thing and then we stopped, but we, so we didn't count, we counted a hundred million when we started it. Or you know whatever we kind of hundred we we kind of a thousand apartments when we started it and then we quietly shelved it and and so they never took the they never took the thousand off and then we then we started it up again and so we added the the thousand again onto the you know so you've got double the effect and, and things like that um, so the question now is so which which of them's right is it the new starts that's right is it the ongoing stuff that's right or is it the completions that's right now I'm guessing the completions are probably the most right is 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 my guess. Um, if you took the completions and you said you spoke about there being two more years, if, if you spoke about the amount they've got under construction um, and said how long can they keep going, they can go for another 10 years <laughs> with just what they what they say they're, they're constructing. The thing is they're probably not. There's probably lots of holes in the ground where somebody's turned the first shovel or, or dug a hole and then just decided, actually, I can't sell this stuff and, and they're never going to complete it. And so, yeah, the, the the real question for me, which I I, don't, I have no idea about the answer, is is it two years? Is it five years? Is it six months? Like when do they finally say, okay, you know what, we built enough, you know, we're just going, we've, you know, we can't we, we can't build a hundred percent of them, um, we, we're not going to build zero percent of them. At what stage do they go? That that's enough. Now we can start pulling the pins on these developers, and that's the question I really don't know. But the, the interesting thing on I was going to get back to on the whole iron ore thing is. Iron ore prices are still really high. Um, and if you went back, so you go back two years and I turn to you, Martin, and I say, okay, this housing crash in the um, in in the property sector is going to continue. We're going to see, you know, developers falling over or, or almost falling over left, right and center. We're going to see, you know, the, those crater. In the meantime, we're going to have this green revolution where we're going to be producing solar panels and EVs. We're going to have an EV price war and too many EVs in, in China and and all this other stuff going on. Now, which is going to be better, copper or, or iron ore? And you would have turned and gone, well, copper, you know, copper is being used in all these EVs and it's got all, you know, all these, you know, all these green metals and building all this transmission. And you go, well, the opposite's happened. And so what we've seen is all these, you know, lithiums and and copper and and all these energy metals that are sort of supposedly involved in that in the um, uh, in the broader green sector, they're they're the ones that have suffered. Mean, meanwhile, iron ore's held up really strongly, um, and and I don't it, that seems like uh, sort of the Wiley Coyote moment. You know, it's iron ore's on the it's over the edge of the cliff and it's just running on on thin air, and at some stage it's going to drop, but. When that happens, it's uh yeah, it's hard to tell. Uh, I, I would have thought it would happen six months ago, but it's um uh, defined gravity. So I mean, if you bring up the Fortescue share price, um, I think we're hitting pretty close to record highs on that. Yeah, we'll have a look at that in so, just a second. Um, the yeah, uh, yeah it, I mean. As with all of these things, you know, the expectation and reality is often a bit different. This is the Fortescue, you, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can look it's at a, that, you know. Uh, basically, is there, a housing, is, is there a biggest customer having a huge housing crash? Yeah, exactly. well, it doesn't look like it from the chart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and if and, you just, um, Rio, of course, is, is, is not quite, you know, the, the same sort of trajectory as Fortescue because, of course, they've yeah. got a different business model. But the, it does show yeah. you that uh, in some areas, we are still seeing quite a lot of uh, momentum. And as you say, the, the sort of the theory of what, what's going to happen, what actually is happening is the problem. It's, it's diverged significantly. Yeah. And the, and when you look at the uh, – what you spoke with about was important, though, in insofar as Australia is like the world's biggest supplier of lithium, for example, and, yeah. and, and a pretty big supplier of copper and all these other metals. That have, but when you look at how much export revenue we get from lithium – and in taxes and stuff like that, it's tiny. 
And same with copper. And you get through all these other metals and you're like, well, yeah, we make something from it. We're a major supplier in the world, but they're just, they're just not that big. Whereas when you look at the big ones, iron ore and coal are the real huge ones. That's where all the revenue comes from. That's why um, you know, we can afford tax cuts and stuff like that is that um, all this extra revenue is 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 coming through from those, and um, you know as uh, well last time we had a, an iron ore boom, well not last time but you know ten years ago, fifteen years ago when we had an iron ore boom and and then we took all those temporary profits and and gave them away as tax cuts to the middle class and mm. um, yeah looks like we're uh, we we're doing the it, same again. We'll be done again. Exactly. Yes. Just on, on lithium, just so people can get the contrast right. This is the uh, China lithium metal spot. <laughs> It's dropped considerably from where it was previously, and that's an yeah. interesting so, observation. Yeah, and so lithium, lithium. I, I, I don't know if I've spoken about that before on on here. Um, the thing to think about with lithium is that it's going through some incredible growth. It is genuinely in a super cycle, um, and and what I, when I like. You keep hearing these resources super cycles, and and most of all, mostly they they're bull. Like most of the, most of the, the resources super cycles we've been speaking about are just not they're just normal cycles. Cycles happen in resources. Um, the one the res, the the boom we saw in uh, the two thousands, early two thousands, that was a super cycle. We saw production volumes, you know, up 20, 30, 40, 50%, like all these new mines coming on. That's a boom. We're, we're, we're building all these new mines and prices are booming. That's a super cycle. Um, that's what's happening in lithium. And the question with, with that is there is this incredible amount of lithium coming on in terms of new projects. And there's incredible growth as well. And so the thing is, if lithium, if demand for lithium grows by 40% next year, but supply grows by 42%, the price goes down. If supply grows by 35%, now the price is going up. It's And who knows whether it's going to be, like when you're talking about these massive year-on-year -year growths, it's very hard to tell where it's going to be. Now, as a general rule, the way I look at it is the companies within that sector need to be able to, if they can produce profitably, then they're going to, they're going to do more of it. If you look at lithium, um, a bunch of it's hard rock, a bunch of it comes from um, uh, salt flats, and you basically dissolve it and pull pull the salt out. Um, the hard rock is sort of like five thousand dollars a ton or below is typically your costs. Uh, the uh, the ones where you're coming from the the salt um, flats and things like that, you get up closer to seven or eight thousand, maybe even as much as ten thousand uh, dollars a ton. So when you see prices of um, yeah, seventy or eighty thousand dollars a ton that we saw. Yeah, everyone's producing as fast as they can. Now, if prices fall below ten thousand, you're starting, you're going to see some of these mines either shut down or start thinking about shutting down or, or, or stopping their expansions. So yeah, so so where's you know where would I look? Look at the prices um, below twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, you you probably want fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to encourage new demand coming on because they need so much extra. Um, yeah. 15 to 20 below. Okay, now I'm thinking about buying it. It gets to 70 or 80. I'm absolutely thinking about selling it. And, you know, in the 20 to 30 range is probably where we're going to see it for the next few years, I would guess, because we need so much of it and you need a, you need a price signal to to uh, to spark the demand. But you're going to go through it because the growth is so extreme. You know, you might go through a year where prices languish at $10,000 and then you'll you know, and then not enough comes on, and the next thing you know, we're back up to sixty or seventy thousand dollars. It's going to be volatile because of the the extreme growth that you're seeing within that. Yeah, and uh, just to uh, give you a bit of a flavour there, this is Lion Town Resources, right? So that you know, that's what that's what happens, <laughs> right? Yes, come off the other side of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and look, um, and, and this is exactly that's uh, keep coming back to this point when you look at the growth in volumes. So, I mean, in the end for these, I'm not sure about Lion Town in, in particular, but I'm pretty sure they're increasing their volumes. Most of these guys are. When you look at the, the the amount of extra lithium that's coming on, it's going up every year. It's going, you know, every month with more lithium, more lithium, more lithium. Like that's what these guys are do not there to do. Get in there, pull this stuff out of the ground and produce it. And 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 so fundamentally you go, you know, I thought the, you know, I thought the lithium market was going to expand and these companies were going to grow production. They did. It's a question about how much you want to pay for that. And that's, yeah, have to it, can't stress that enough. Keep coming back to that point. You get your fundamentals right. But then this next question is, 
how much do I pay for those fundamentals? And I think we've shown tonight, we've spoken about, you know, the ARC fund, about what they're doing and how they they often get it wrong. We've spoken about, um, uh, you know, the iron ore sector. We've spoken about cars, Tesla, and, and lithium is just not one more example of that. Yeah, great. There's a great story behind lithium. They're going to grow. They're absolutely going to grow. We need way more batteries. We need lots more into it. But it doesn't mean you pay any price for it. Yeah. And so there's two observations because I think with ARC, you know, so they got some of their thinking right, but timing wrong. And that's the yep. first risk. You know, you can actually go in too early or, or, or sometimes go, go too late. Mm. Um, it's also true, of course, that you've got these contentions between, you know, different sectors of the market and different markets. And so if you look at the performance of the US versus Australia, well, the US has done a lot better than Australia for all sorts of reasons mm. that we've touched on some of those. Um, so it makes the complexity of trying to think about asset allocation and, and stopping. I mean, this this is not simple. You know, and, no. and, 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 well, and, and also there's sometimes like that, well, we spoke about the cost in terms of driverless cars and coming down. Yeah. So we go through this whole thing where we're like talking about, and I'm, I'm on board with them saying, yeah, look, driverless cars could be much cheaper. And so we could, you know, we could get rid of, Whatever it is, you know, seventy percent of the world's auto production could could just go because we just don't need it anymore. And in the meantime, Mark's out there buying Tesla, and so you're like, well, yeah, but isn't there a conflict there anyway? So yeah, <laughs> there's um, yeah, there's there's uh, you know, it's it's coming back to the point, I guess, is that people are um, uh, even if you even if you sort of poo poo some of their results and and laugh at you know. Look at these guys buying these stocks at crazy multiples. It doesn't mean every bit of thinking they ever do is going to be wrong. And mm. I actually think some of their longer term look at some of the, some of their thoughts on sectors and, and trends is actually pretty good for a lot of it. And it's well worth well worth at least looking in, even if it's different to yours, at least challenging your own market views with with those. I don't always think they get the conclusion right, but yeah, but I think their inputs are are, are generally are often good. And, and, that, good. and that's part of the point, isn't it? You know, you can get multiple voices, multiple views, and then you know. Pick, pick and choose, um, yes. but but nobody has perfect foresight. Nobody gets it right 100% of the time. And I guess mm. it's ultimately, it's um, as we've said a few times, question one, what happens if you get it wrong? You know, what's the downside risk? And question two, yep. if you need to be in the market, then, you know, you've got to make these decisions. You, you can't necessarily just withdraw and say, well, I'm not playing. Yeah. And I, and I speak to lots of people about this whole idea about, um, you know, zero or one. There's a lot of people who are like, okay, you're telling me the market's expensive, you've got these concerns or whatever, okay, I'm going to be 100% cash. And it's like, yes, but, you know, there's, I can paint different timeframes and the question is, if the market goes into a bubble, it can go, you know, let, let's say we're looking at the market and saying, you know, we it, we think it should be cheaper, we think it should be 20% cheaper, um, but then over the next five years, we're actually expecting it to grow by, you know, 10% per annum. And so, yeah, it goes to, down 20 and then up 50 or maybe it just sits at 20% higher and just goes sideways for a few years and then then takes off from there. Or it jumps from that 20 to the, you know, and then then sits sideways. It's a question about timing and time frame. And, and nobody's right, as you said, nobody's nobody's got an exact crystal wall. And so the question is saying, you know, it's diversified. I don't like taking absolutes of like, I'm all in the market, I'm all out of the market, I'm all in the market. You know, not only do you raise tax problems, but you've got lots of timing issues. And so, you know, having at least some exposure is uh, is important. Absolutely. Well, um, Damon, we've done it again. We've got the end of our time, yes. uh, but we, we covered most of the things we wanted to touch on. So I appreciate uh, your insights. So. And, we've left um, lots more for next time. Though. Well, I was going to say, you know, we, yeah. we can always make sure that the same as in that. Now, we should explain that, of course, the RBA is now flicking to six weeks. But uh, if you're up for it, I'm still you know, great if you come back early next month because um, – I think monthly is about the right cyclical um, periodicity for these, even if it doesn't now fit with the RBA. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's what All right. we're doing. And uh, I've put links and things below if you want to find out more about um, the Water the World Funds and uh, Nucleus Wealth. Uh, you know, we we think that the transparency and openness that uh, Damien and his team have is is pretty amazing. And uh, there are lots of different formulations. And just as we sort of end the show, Damien, let's underscore again. You know, there are different ways of engaging with with what you do, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we do active, we do passive. Um, with all the portfolios we run, it's all about transparencies and letting people sort of 
put overlays on, on, on the portfolio. So you can see every stock that we own. Um, you can see the reasons why we own them. And then you can go over that and say, okay, I want some extra cloud computing stocks or or I don't want any any carbon stocks within my portfolio or whatever it is, you know, that um, that either fits your investment view or your own pers- personal ethics. And the idea is that uh, if we've got this portfolio, it's like a core portfolio that sits in the middle um, and you and you can see every asset that's in it and you know why they're in there, you can then put other stuff around that. So, you know, if you're, you can look at that portfolio and go, okay, they don't own any cryptocurrency. If you want to do something on that, you can do something. If you, if you look at it and you go, I want cloud computing, you can go, oh, actually, they've already got a reasonable exposure to cloud computing. Maybe you want some more, but I don't need to buy as much as what I, what I might have because I know that my superannuation fund or my, or my own personal um, fund has, has got this these investments in it. And I can actually see what they are, and yeah, some people like to, um, you know, for example, if they work in the banking sector, they might cut out all the banks, and they might say, well, okay, I've already, I already get stock from my company, or I already work in that sector, and so my my salary is is exposed to that. I'm happy to to, to take that much exposure there, and and then within my investments, I don't need that extra exposure. So yeah, lots of different types of things like that. Like that would do for everyone. Yeah, terrific. Well, thank you very much, as always. Really appreciate it. And uh, look forward to catching up again next month. And uh, I'll take you offline and just uh, close the show. See you later. Thanks. See you. Thanks. So there you go, folks. Hope you enjoyed that uh, very interesting conversation, as always. And uh, next week, it's just me. I'll be on and I'll be talking about uh, the um, financial stress and modelling that I've uh, just done till the end of uh, the last month. A um, lot of uh, very important insights coming out of that. And we look at the postcodes and things. So that's uh, the show next week. And uh, in following weeks, I've got a few other guests coming on. So uh, keep in touch with the live streams. And of course, meantime, I uh, continue to uh, make my recorded shows and post them most days. And uh, some of those are doing very well. Please like and share as always. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for all the Super Chats, um, Jason in particular and uh, others too. Really appreciate that. And I'll look forward to uh, seeing you very again soon. Just to say the dogs are hill still here. Um, <laughs> in, I, I'm not sure whether I can interview the dogs, but um, um, you know that they are certainly part of the uh, part of the stream and part of the show. Anyway, I want to say thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening. Have a good evening, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio.